US Array um, sighting program uh, for the Earthscope's transportable array. Um, US Array itself um, consists of four different observatories. The transportable array, which is typically called US Array, the moving one. The um, reference network, which are the permanently sighted seismic stations that don't move around. Um, the magnetotelluric array to study the magnetic field. And the flexible array, which are short-term experiments like Steve was talking about um, at the end there, um, where they stay for a short time to, to examine a specific spot. So we're going to talk mostly about the uh, transportable array. play. There we go. OK, so each one of the stations stays in the ground for two years, and then it gets picked up and put on the front of the array. So as we go across, we'll eventually cover the entire continent of North America in the US. And we're about to here now. And then we'll head over to Alaska. So there'll be about uh, 1,600 sites throughout the US. And they stay for two years. So in the two-year time, they're picking up earthquakes from all around the world and able to um, examine the structure under North America by the way those seismic waves come up from different parts of the world. So we're getting sort of a, almost like a CAT scan of the US um, with it slowly going across. All right, so how do you get 1,600 seismic stations sighted across the US? It's not an easy task. Um, and like Steve was saying earlier, um, you've got geology in place to uh, worry about. And you've also got people in place to worry about, landowners. And you've also got buildings and other things in place. So one of the ideas was that uh, way back in the beginning, uh, the thought was that uh, only professional seismologists could do this project because they are the only ones that are capable of finding the sites and installing the equipment and knowing where to put it. And the thought was that's going to be really hard um, to get professional seismologists all across the country um, to go do this. So the thought was, well, we have all these grad students who need work <laughs> and have nothing to do during the summertime. So why couldn't you have grad students go out? They love to drive around and uh, <laughs> look at the landscape in the country, and let them do all the work of citing the locations for it. And that's what we try to do, um, have uh, students do the citing uh, in cooperation with uh, a principal investigator from a university who was sort of managing the project for them. The citing was divided up into manageable pieces for folks uh, to do. The universities would help find the sites in their region. One of the benefits is the students are familiar with the area that they live in. Um, so it's much easier than somebody coming from out of the area to find it. Uh, the sighting areas um, ideally should be 70 kilometers apart. Um, there was sort of an error bar of a circle around it that would be OK sites to do. So already the area that could be chosen was narrowed down to uh, a smaller region around that 70 kilometer dot uh, for folks to pick. And then it was divided up. There was about 120 students who helped us with it, about 50 universities uh, over the course of the project. They cited about uh, 1,200 sites. And typically, uh, the college that was working with us would hire some students, typically two or three, to go out. Uh, the student teams would receive about three and a half days of training on how to select good sites, uh, how to use the GPS equipment to uh, locate the possible chosen sites, how to talk to landowners uh, if they found an area that was like an optimal spot within that 75 kilometer spacing. Uh, it might be somebody's field where they farm. <laughs> And uh, you can't just drive up and plop a seismic instrument in their yard and say, it's going to be here for two years, thanks, <laughs> uh, without their help and cooperation. So uh, part of the training also was uh, public relations in chatting with folks and uh, getting them on board to help us with the project. Um, and then they, about nine weeks during the summer, going around to all their sites, checking, uh, suggesting places. So just last summer, uh, here are the universities that helped us on the East Coast, uh, including College of Charleston. And there was their area for it. So it's a fairly large area to drive around in nine weeks and pick out sites. So in each of these dots, um, that was the optimal spacing for, this, for the sites. And around those sites, there would be sort of an error area where they could find, find something close to this, as close as you can to the middle. Um, they would head out, um, find a site, mark it with a, a GPS longitude latitude location, and then send that back to the PIs, and they would decide whether that was a good site or not. So when you head out to a, to a station, that's, that's about all we're going to see on the trip. right? And there's the solar panel. We're not even going to see the solar panel. But I don't think it's hooked up yet. So there's, there's a nice pole, a nice silver Festivus pole <laughs> with uh, nothing else there um, for it. So the, the actual site itself, there's a completed site, um, is not very large. 
That's about what, three feet across? Ish, yeah, three feet meter across. Um, so a pretty small site that sits there for a while. So they used uh, laptops and portable GPS to go out to the sites, uh, find a site, uh, evaluate the sites to see if it was a decent place to, to, to put the equipment, which involves making sure there's no high traffic areas. Uh, it's not an area where folks can get to it and possibly wander off with a nice free solar panel for their house. Um, <laughs> and, and also a, sort of a quiet location where you'd get good scientific data, so not next to roads. Um, where lots of cars and trucks are going by, or train tracks, um, which would make the data less useful for it. Uh, they'd submit their reports and then uh, hopefully enjoy having cited all the spots <laughs> and also have fun while they're out there. And the students really enjoyed going out and being part of a, a national, you know, professional scientific research project. Um, so some of the outcomes was it allowed us to identify a large number of sites at relatively low cost. Graduate students are cheap. <laughs> The uh, landowners became volunteer hosts for the sites. So for uh, almost all of them, um, there was no cost involved in us using their land to put the site on. And in fact, uh, many landowners were, were really excited to be part of a, a science project in their backyard. It became sort of their seismic station uh, with things. And then it was also engaging the next generation of earth scientists, which were the grad students helping us out, who will become the PIs in the future. <laughs> things. Um, and then we also do some things for the landowners. Uh, we produce a publication called OnSite, uh, which describes some of the research that's happening. Um, we, the landowners can go online and see a web display of data from their particular seismic station. So when there's a big earthquake in Japan, they can go look at the data that their station detected from that earthquake. Um, and then a final summary report of uh, what happened with their station. Um, one of the things you guys should be interested in is as the uh, US Array transportable array comes to your area, we have been getting lots of media interest in it on the East Coast. Because the first question is, why are you putting lots of seismometers on the East Coast? We don't have earthquakes here. Must be something going on. Um, well, <laughs> up until uh, the Virginia earthquake, that was pretty much mostly sort of kind of true. Um, we do have earthquakes here, um, but uh, not as much as on the West Coast. So on the West Coast, it was, oh, more seismometers in the ground, big deal. That happens all the time. As we're heading East, you've got a good p potential for um, press wanting to know about this project, especially when there's a huge earthquake. Um, did, did this array of seismometers detect that earthquake? Well, yes, for it. So what I've been telling folks who work in museums and national parks is here's an opportunity for you to get some free press without doing a whole lot of work. Um, find the station that's closest to you, adopt it as your own, because it's the one close to you, and then become the expert on earthquakes so when the media calls, they already know that you know about it. So you'll be the first person they call. So if you're already doing you know, earth science and geology programs at your facility, uh, you now have sort of a, a free end of the media. Because, oh, the experts are at that museum. I'll go call them and find out what they know about this. So let's see. And to help you do that, uh, and also to help you with uh, education outreach, uh, IRIS produces quite a bit of public display material, uh, including lesson plans and displays. And one of the things that I'll talk about tomorrow is uh, we also have a loan program for our kiosks, uh, which for this year is including the Southeast US. So you have the opportunity to um, apply for and get one of our kiosks for free for a year um, in your place. So you can see earthquakes off of the seismic station closest to you. Uh, and then our displays have a lot of regional seismology uh, and geology information, Cascadia Basin Range, New Madrid, Earthscope. Uh, we're working on additional content, including East Coast geology. And then lots of folks help us to create the content for things. Thank you.